Hey Joy, the biggest concern I hear from the audience is number one, it's too late for me to get into AI. People say that, or there's no opportunities, or it's gonna take all my jobs away. The last one is absolutely not true. So let's start there. And I think the way to think about that is people who use AI will take the jobs away from people who don't use AI. So going back to your first uh, question, I think you should jump in, not just you and I, but everyone. Yeah. Uh, it's not too late because the space is so new that even finding experts in this area is very difficult because there are very few of them. Hey everyone, it's David Bommel coming to you from Cisco Live, back with the amazing Vjoy. Vjoy, great to have you here. Thank you for having me, David. So you work in, I don't want to say mad scientist because I don't want to insult you, but it, it sounds like you guys are really doing some really interesting things. So tell us about you know the organization and some of the great things coming out of it. Sure. So I'll take mad scientist. It's a good one. But we actually deliver things that are good for humanity. So we're not the crazy James Bond villain out okay. here. But Outshift, uh, it has a pretty clear mission. The mission of the group is to take Cisco into new markets, so go into new problem spaces that Cisco hasn't been in, and build a meaningful business in those markets. So we are completely end-to-end -end in the sense of, think of us like as an internal Y combinator. So we've got product engineering, all the way to customer success and sales and marketing, all fully contained. Because when you're dealing with new personas, user or buyer personas, you need to have empathy with those personas. And that's a tough nut to crack. I mean, it's. I always feel it's easier to build the product. Yes. The go-to-market is where you succeed or fail, and that's uh, that's a tough problem. I mean, that's a problem with a, with a lot of you know inventors and people like that, right? They create something really interesting, but how do you actually make it useful for a wide audience? That's right, and I think that's where the mad scientist analogy probably breaks down because yes. I think it's a mad scientist and the mad salesperson and the mad marketing person all combined. Where do you see it going? Where do you see the future going? Because I mean, you're working on all this cool technology. Like, give us some vision about where things are going. Sure, I mean, I think the way I'd like to describe it is like, so tech, first of all, tech changes happen in step functions. This is one of those step functions. And there have been a few in the past. I mean, the internet, the mobile phone, especially with uh, touch interfaces and the app store. Uh, but to us, this is as big, if not bigger. And you will see the ramifications of this over time. So I'll give you an example that was probably more related to our audience, which is in the IT space, yeah. uh, cloud. So that was a step function because yeah. nobody is, very few are building and deploying from the ground up. I mean, if you were to stand up a web server today, yeah. you're not going to buy a Spark system and build everything from scratch. But what happened when cloud rolled around for the first time? You did what was called lift and shift. So you knew things work like this on-prem and it just took that blueprint and just moved it to the cloud. You did not do cloud native. But now everything is cloud native. You, you're doing microservices, you're doing containers and serverless, and you're actually using native services from AWS and Google and Microsoft and so on. It's the same thing that's going to happen here. So I think right now what people are doing is, I mean, you're seeing this thing called assistants and agents, and you'll have these things everywhere. And they'll be augmenting your workflow. But to me, this is the lift and shift phase. Because you're not stepping back and saying, what should the user experience look like if I started from scratch? Yeah. Because right now, one of the things that you see is prompt fatigue. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, I mean, I think if you, so you, if you think about Siri or Alexa or Google Assistant, how many times do you have to ask the same question? Exactly, yeah. To get a song play, right? And uh, think about Bard or GPT. And you want to ask, like, explain quantum to me. You need to ask that question like 10 times over to get the right answer. And the problem is you might not be able to trust the answer you get, right? Because it could be uh, making yeah, it up. Yeah, it's making it up. You need to verify it. You need to ask it 10 times over to figure out the essence of what you need. Yeah. Uh, so sometimes, like especially if you're dealing with a SaaS product, sometimes it's just easier to point and click. And we've been used to that. So now with the lift and shift notion that's happening right now is you've got a, pro a point and click interface and you've got an assistant on the side and those worlds are like ships in the night. They don't communicate. And so what we're doing is we've just shipped a context-aware assistant for one of our products, Panoptica, which is a security product. Okay. And the idea behind that is how about we blend the positives of both of these worlds together? So I might be looking at an attack path that an attacker might take to compromise my application in this case. And it shows that your AWS S3 buckets are misconfigured. 
Now, I might have an assistant sitting on the side, and I might be asking it 10 prompts and 10 questions and racking up my costs. Yes. Yeah, people forget that, right? The oh, tokens, people right? People forget that, exactly. And, so, and then you might get some response, which is not even relevant, or it's like a little bit vague and general purpose. So what we've done is we said we, we've introduced something called a context-aware assistant, which is almost like a Google lens. I don't know if you've used that feature uh, in Google, where you can take your camera and point it to anything, and it tells you what that is. So we have a Google lens-like feature on a UI. Okay. So you can take a lens-like icon and basically point it to anything in the UI. So you could point it to this S3 bucket, which is blinking, and as soon as you point it, the assistant appears next to it, and every prompt that you type in is actually now context-aware to that place. Oh, uh, that's great. Where you pointed it, so you don't have to go around trying to figure out what's going on. So everything that you ask is actually about that S3 bucket in your environment. So it's very specific to your environment as well. And it's not just one object you can drag and drop. You can select multiple objects, multiple tables. So it's a complete uh, multimodal, as they say. It's a multimodal experience uh, between text and images in the UI. But to us, it's like, that's huge. Nobody's done that. It's an industry first. But that's also like step two. To us, it's like, if we were given a blank slate. Yeah, what would you do? What would that look like? And I'm not ready to answer that yet, but <laughs> it's, it's a teaser like for it. the next time around. Oh, brilliant. Okay. So we can expect something. Yes. I think uh, just the information deluge that all of us are facing and the way all of these uh, uh, user interfaces have been designed, they don't blend together nicely. Yeah, I think the problem is when people think about AI, they just think it's chat GPT for a lot of people, right? But AI isn't just that. Yeah, actually, the, the thing that we are seeing is, again, Again, going back to the step function analogy, uh, the step function happened November 22 because yeah. you took something that was that existed for a while. Uh, it's been a linear progression, but then you made it consumable by everybody. So you yeah. democratized it yeah. to some degree. And so now everybody is can, can talk to ChatGPT and Bard now and so on. So 23 was low-hanging fruit. People are touching it, feeling it, smelling it, just like trying to figure out what's going on. Yeah. Uh, now you're getting a good sense of what's happening. So 24 is going to be about serious deployments. Okay. And so we are going to see security assistance and networking assistance, and we're going to see real critical business, uh, critical use cases pop up with these assistants and, and generative AI-backed uh, systems. So because of that, there's another thing happening. So the entire model space is evolving. So you are going to have a GPT-5, or you're going to have a Gemini next version for your everyday needs. So these are general purpose foundation models. Yes. But there is a rise of specific foundation models for specific use cases. So you will see security foundation models and networking or maybe infrastructure foundation models as an example. So that's one thing that's going to happen. And these things will be smaller, more efficient, and more accurate. The other thing that's going to happen is open source is coming in a big way. And so a bunch of these models are actually already open source. So Lama 2 is open source, Mistral has a, has a pretty decent open source model. All of these open source models will get picked up by savvy individuals and get customized to their use case. So like we are thinking you should have foundation models running in a switch, running in a Meraki camera. Oh, so AI directly inside? Yeah, directly inside. Because if you think about all of these models, they're becoming multimodal. So it's text to speech, speech to visual, uh, text to visual. So a camera or a switch can benefit from these highly efficient, accurate, smaller foundation models. So not calling them large language models, yeah. but yeah. smaller foundation models that are highly distributed in nature. And that's going to happen quite a bit. So, and in fact, one of the things that we are seeing is also specific use cases within a singular app. Pick one app, and I'll pick Panoptica, which is something that we ship. It's a cloud application security product. For different features within that same app, I have multiple models. So one app can have like 10, 20, 30 models sitting inside the app. So how do you deal with the complexity of all of this? So we are, we are actually beyond the hype cycle to some degree, and we're in the space of making this well abstracted, uh, bringing in velocity, bringing in the trust, safety, security, and scale aspects to the foundation model family. And that's where I think 24 is going to be. So tell us about this new, what's the right name for it? This new product that's come out? Yeah, so it's actually, we just released a product called Motific. Yep. And the idea is, uh, if you think about generative AI, that's the buzz everywhere. Yep. And it allows you to do some interesting things. I and mean, generative AI could make all of us 
speak like uh, Joe Biden or Donald Trump or whoever. Which is good and bad. Which is good and bad. And uh, But it allows, we feel that it is a step function when it comes to human productivity and human creativity, both. And it's going to change the way all of us do business. You're talking about AI, AI scientific, general, right? Yeah. Exactly. And so when you think about the potential of generative AI, yeah. there is this urge to build stuff with it. Yeah. And it's one thing to do, build your apps or plan your wedding or go on a trip and use BARD and chat GPT. It's a different thing to configure your network or remediate your security uh, problems. I'm hallucinating, right? Uh, yeah, hallucinations, toxicity bias, yes. security problems, which models are the right things for the problem because this space is evolving so rapidly. So there's a whole host of problems. And so what we decided was build a product, Motific, which allows you to safely and rapidly create as well as deploy generative AI applications. And for us, applications are basically motifs. That's where the name comes from. So you might think of a motif in music, or you might think of a motif in a computer vision or video, or in our case, it's primarily text and code. But these are motifs that you start with. And the product allows you to create these motifs rapidly across a variety of providers. So whether you're using GPT or BARD or Anthropic or uh, Cohere, or you're using something open source that might be in a cloud provider or on-prem, it doesn't matter. So you have multiple providers. We abstract things out for you. And then it allows you to figure out security, and trust, and safety, and ROI. Because these things are not cheap. Yeah, exactly. So are you getting the ROIs that you planned for? So the product actually is pretty comprehensive and allows you to go on that journey. So this is a product that I could buy and then create an AI for my own organization. Is, is that the idea or is it more than that? So think of it as... Uh, Think of it as a SaaS application Okay, that is a wrapper around your enterprise. So we're calling it an enterprise Gen AI hub. So it's a hub that you go to. And the other complication that we're seeing in organizations today is the creation of Gen AI apps as well as the deployment of these apps is actually a multi-persona, multi-team organization problem because you have the builders who are trying to build something out of generative AI. You have the GM who's like, I'm paying for this stuff. Yeah. Am I getting the ROI that I need? Yeah. Am I getting the insights? Yeah. So you have the GM and then you have a whole set of approvers. So you have approvers like CIOs, security officers, you have legal, privacy and trust, because all of these issues crop up. I mean, we, we are a big believer in responsible AI and trustworthy AI. And so everything that we would like to roll out and our customers would like to consume or roll out uh, should be based on trustworthy and responsible AI principles. So how do you enable that? So all of these personas need to come together. And that's why we're calling this a Gen AI hub for the enterprise, because this is a singular place where all of these personas come together. The other thing that happens is, and one of the things you can realize, planning a birthday party is one thing. Yeah, that's easy. That's easy. You might plan your trip to London. Yeah. But let's say you want to build a finance bot yes. for your organization. Let's say you want it to be credible enough that it's actually sitting in the boardroom with you and it's actually answering questions for the CFO. That's where we all should be headed towards. But that's a tough problem. It's tough because of a whole slew of things that I just talked about, but also the assistant does not have context around your organization. So what are my financial reports for this quarter? That's highly sensitive, highly contextual, highly, there's a recency element to it, right? And so how do you, like, sort of capture some of those knowledge sources and data sources to then customize your assistant so that it can be useful as a finance assistant for you in the boardroom. And so bringing all of these data sources, your policies in the organizations, your compliance needs, and your identities all together along with these personas that I talked about, and then enabling velocity, enabling trust, enabling safety, security, and ROI. KPIs is what the product does. Is that something to do with a RAG or is that something different? So RAG is one of the techniques we use. So RAG stands for Retrieval Augmented Generation. Yep. And the idea behind RAG is every foundation model out there is actually a general purpose model. And so it's, it's actually learned on the entirety of human public knowledge, but does not know the ins and outs of an organization and the knowledge sources and the documents that exist within your organization. So RAG is a technique where you can take a foundation model and you can customize it 
by feeding its sources that are particular to you. And in fact, it gets a little bit more nuanced than that because like we were talking about the finance assistant, yeah. you would not want engineering to see exactly anything from that assistant. You would not want HR. And vice versa, you would not want finance to look at HR documents and so on. Right? So it's not just within the enterprise, but it's within the teams. And that's where identities across both humans and machines and documents all come into play when you think about customizing these assistants for enterprise-wide use cases. So looking at sort of the, the world that we're in, cybersecurity, networking, Cisco very strong in those areas. What are you seeing Cisco's sort of viewpoint of AI? Yeah, so I think uh, so. Cisco has been working with AI models for a long time, even before. Yeah, people forget. People forget. I mean, I think if you think about WebEx, yeah. uh, one of the most fascinating examples that we have is noise cancellation. And that's a pretty impressive AI model. It's not a generative AI model, but it's a pretty impressive AI model that actually filters out everything but your voice and makes it really effective. So we've been working with AI models for a long, long, long time. Uh, but the way we think about AI within Cisco is in two big buckets. One is productivity and the other is product. So productivity is, especially after generative AI, what are the tools and software that we can roll out within the organization to make all of us more productive? Yeah. And so we had an iTalk uh, yesterday. Uh, we brought in Fletcher, who's our CIO, and he's been rolling out a whole slew of tools uh, within Cisco. So for example, uh, GitHub Copilot for, uh, for engineers to develop code. Uh, we are also rolling out our own version of a chat GPT-like interface inside, which is customized with our data sources and makes it more effective for Cisco employees. There are, there are applications in HR and in legal and in marketing that is being rolled out because all of these make all of us more productive, more creative. And I think that is something that all of us uh, should benefit from. So that's the productivity side. And then there's the product side. And within product also, I'd like to distinguish it between two buckets. One is AI for improving product. And the other one is building product to improve AI. Okay, yeah, yeah. And so AI for improving product is using these models in our networking and collaboration and security and observability products to make these products better. An assistant being one yeah. great example, auto remediation or uh, figuring out anomaly detection and so on and so forth are all examples of using AI within the product. Product for AI is actually a tougher nut to crack. So this is what do you build to push the bar forward on, on, on AI itself? Yeah. And so one of the products that we just announced and we briefly touched upon Motific yeah. is actually in that bucket. The other product that we've talked about for a while now is Silicon One. So if you build out clusters from the ground up for training your models or for inferencing as well, our Silicon One based products are actually the de facto fabric enabler for most of the clusters that you might be using. So if you think about any hyperscaler and what they use for their AI clusters, you can bet your life that uh, they'll be using Silicon One underneath. Oh, that's interesting. So that that's... Because uh, that, you, always, you always think it's something else. You always think it's something else, but it's, it's Silicon One. And so that's at the lowest end. And then as you go up the stack, Motific to us sits at the highest level of the stack. And so as you again roll out these AI-first applications, how can you compress that time to roll out from months, which is what where it is today, to days or even hours? And then when you roll that out, like we discussed, how do you figure out ROI and your KPIs and actually get deeper into insights, not just from the sense of how much am I spending with a chat GPT or a GPT or a BARD, but also go inside the prompts that you're sending out, the responses that you're getting back and figure out how effective that prompt response session has been. So almost like a deep packet inspection version yeah. of, of, uh, of a Gen AI a problem space. And we are calling this the prompt processing unit. So it's like an NPU, but it's for the prompt or a DPU and this for the prompt. So that's the other thing that we're innovating around within Motific. And then at Cisco, we've been a big believer in responsible AI for a really, really long time. So we've had human rights and privacy as it pertains to data all the way from 2012. Yeah, because it's a worry, right? All it's, my data is out there especially, getting mined. Especially in Europe and with the EU Data Act and the AI Act about to be signed in a couple of months, a couple of weeks, I guess. Uh, it's a big worry. And so what do we do about that? So we are enabling Motific with trust and safety practices and frameworks 
So you can deploy your Gen AI first applications in a way that is that minimizes, cannot probably remove completely, uh, but that minimizes toxicity, bias, hallucinations, and false content, and so on. So that's the third pillar. And finally, uh, security. And that's a big one for, for our audience. And if you think about two years out, you ask me, what do you think is going to happen with AI two years from now? I feel we'll stop talking about AI because it'll be embedded into every product that you see. So it's just Interesting. a matter of life, fact of life. And so electricity. It's electricity. And so if you think about that world, it's just another component in your application. And in that kind of a world, how do you ensure that these models, which are now spitting out recommendations or spitting out content, how do you make sure that they are not compromised? And if you're compromised, and that compromise can happen anywhere in that pipeline. It can happen when you're asking the model for something, so prompt injection, all the way to when you're training or fine-tuning that model as well. So we just rolled out a Gen AI protection in the Panoptica product, which actually starts getting into this sort of LLM protection starting from the inference side first, but then slowly moving towards uh, fine-tuning and, and, and uh, trading as well. Vijoy, the biggest concern I hear from the audience is number one, it's too late for me to get into AI, people say that, or there's no opportunities, or it's gonna take all my jobs away. The last one is absolutely not true. So let's start there. And I think the way to think about that is people who use AI will take the jobs away from people who don't use AI. So going back to your first uh, question, I think you should jump in, not just you and I, but everyone. Yeah. Uh, it's not too late because the space is so new that even finding experts in this area is very difficult because there are very few of them. This space is, was invented pretty much in 2017 by a core team that is a handful of people or a little bit more than that. So it's not too late. Everybody's figuring it out, including us. And so... Jump in right now, that's the biggest mistake you can do, is not jump in. Jump in right now, there are lots of free courses available. Go and read up, a lot of material even at outshift.com. Go and figure that out. Use the tools, there are free versions out there. Get familiar with them and then use them in your day-to-day. -day. And if you become an expert, which you will, if you spend the time, your jobs are safe. I mean, this is, this is an assistant and augmentation of what you do day-to-day. It's not a replacement for what you do day to day. That's never going to happen. The way I would describe it is like, uh, yes, if you were a machine language programmer and you were stubborn enough to say, I'm not going to learn Python or any high-level programming language, you're doing yourself a disservice. You have to learn a high-level programming language. To me, this is the next level of abstraction. So get your AI knowledge base up, incorporate it in your day to day, and then Learn to use it as a tool like you would use anything else. Uh, do I need to get a PhD, though? If you are building foundation models, maybe. But 99.99% of the world doesn't need to do that. Just the way 99.99% of the world does not need to think about how containers are implemented. You just use the services from a cloud provider or an on-prem provider and build your application. So concentrate on the use cases. Concentrate on your business outcomes. Take the services that exist from providers like us, and just run fast. Vijay, I, I want to thank you for sharing. Going back to how we started, I wouldn't call you a mad scientist, but you know it's fantastic to hear about what's happening in the labs and then how it's changing all of our lives, but also giving us opportunity because that's the worry that people have, right? Thanks so much for you know giving us hope and saying that now's the right time. Is there a place that people can follow you, perhaps connect? Is there a website that people can go to? I'll put the links below for everyone who's watching, but where's a good place to you know, connect? Yeah, we are actually everywhere. So you can go to Outshift by Cisco on LinkedIn. Uh, you can go to outshift.com and the product announcements that we just made around Motific and the Gen AI protection, it's uh, motific.ai. So go and get in touch with us. And we are actually a very learning forward organization as well. So you can actually go there and learn a lot more about cloud native and security and AI. And so just go there and visit and learn. Vijoy, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Great man. to see you again, man. Yep, absolutely. <laughs>